Welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week, we're going to be looking at the case of Williams and London Borough of Hackney, and the citation for this case is 2018 UKSC 37. Now, this is a family law case that puts the power of the state up against the power of parents. It takes place in 2007, at a time when the parents had eight children, aged between 1 and 14. Their 12-year-old son was caught shoplifting, and when he was questioned by the police, he explained that the reason he was stealing was because he had not been given any money for his lunch. He also happened to mention that his father had hit him with a belt, and so the police decided to investigate further. Upon visiting the family home, it was found to be completely unhygienic and not safe for children to live in. Officers decided to exercise a power that they have under section 46 of the Children Act 1989 to move the children to more suitable accommodation for a maximum of 72 hours. And it was the other party to this case, the London Borough of Hackney, that sorted out the foster placements. Meanwhile, the parents were arrested and then interviewed by the police before being released on bail on the condition that they would not have unsupervised contact with any of the children. Also around this time, the parents signed something called a safeguarding agreement that consented to the children remaining in foster care for the time being. The problem central to this case began when the parents were never actually informed that under section 20, subsection 7 of the Children Act, they could formally object to the children's removal, after the expiry of the 72 hours available to the police under section 46. Furthermore, there is also a right under subsection 8 to remove the children from the placements at any time, but the parents were not informed about this either. Fortunately, they did get good legal advice, and about a week after the children had first been taken away, the parents' solicitors gave notice of the intention to withdraw consent. At this stage, it is worth pointing out that the reason consent was not withdrawn straight away was because the bail conditions imposed on the parents that we mentioned earlier prohibited unsupervised contact. In actual fact, it took nearly two months in the end to vary the bail conditions, but the children did eventually return home to their parents. While all of this was going on, the parents started their own proceedings against the London Borough of Hackney that was upheld in the High Court because of a breach to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the right to private and family life. The reasoning behind this decision was that the parents had not given their informed consent, and so after the 72 hours had expired, there was no lawful basis for the local authority accommodating the children. Such an interference with family life and the rights under Article 8 were not therefore in accordance with the law. Hackney appealed the case and was successful before the Court of Appeal, where it was held that no consent is actually required under Section 20 of the Children Act, and any interference with Article 8 is proportionate in the circumstances. This controversial question was appealed again to the Supreme Court, and that's where we pick it up. The starting point for Lady Hale, who gave the lead judgment, was to emphasise that what is described in Section 20 is essentially a voluntary service. We mentioned earlier on that subsection 7 allows anyone with parental responsibility to object if they are in a position to step in and provide accommodation, while subsection 8 goes further and allows a child to be removed from accommodation provided by the local authority by anyone with parental responsibility. Those factors clearly establish the framework under section 20 as voluntary, but then attention must be turned to the actual delegation of responsibility from the parent to the local authority in the first place. How does this occur and what are the requirements? Well, if, for example, a child is lost and the local authority simply assumes responsibility, then clearly no active delegation is needed because that would be impossible to achieve if the parents are missing. However, where a parent does delegate their responsibility, the Supreme Court does concede that delegation must be real and voluntary although they go on to say that said delegation does not necessarily have to be informed. What about the situation in this case where the parents are not exactly missing, but at the same time their delegation is not fully active? The safeguarding agreement that we mentioned earlier achieves the aim of delegating responsibility, but 
is not really the best practice for delegation because it fails to give the full picture. The justices unfortunately choose to avoid the question by noting that because the Section 20 arrangements act as a continuation of the police powers articulated in Section 46, the focus should not be on the delegation, but the exercise of the rights under subsection 7 and 8 to object to the local authority's accommodation of the children and then have them return home. In other words, did the parents actually try to exercise their rights to get their children back, and if so, did the authority comply? This perspective changes things significantly and puts the onus on the parents because the only way that Hackney's actions would be unlawful is if they directly refuse to give the children back following an unequivocal request from the parents. With that in mind, the bail conditions only have limited effect and do not prohibit the exercising of rights under subsection 7 and 8, while the action taken by the solicitors on behalf of the parents were not enough to represent an objection to the local authority or a request for the children to be immediately returned. In the end then, it was found that the children's continued accommodation was lawful and there was no breach of Article 8. It is hard to know where to begin with the problems in this case. On a very superficial level, you can at least sort of see where the Supreme Court is coming from. These eight children were living in squalid conditions, and yet, if the council were found to be breaching human rights law, despite clearly acting in the best interests of the child, then it might discourage other local authorities from helping out in similar situations in the future. That is unfortunately a slippery slope, and there is rarely a benefit that justifies breaching the fundamental rights found in the Convention. To suggest that protecting human rights and protecting children are mutually exclusive is absurd. The court's understanding of the delegation of parental responsibility is also bogus and represents an artificial construction where the law is made to fit the conclusion. On the one hand, it is held that any such delegation has to be real and voluntary, yet it is also apparently the case that it does not have to be informed. This is so the failure by the local authority to inform the parents of their rights is not fatal to the case, but it is hard to see how any form of consent can be real and voluntary if it is not informed consent. You might volunteer to help an old lady cross the road, but if I then told you that the road was the M25, you might think twice. This is only the start of the issues, however. By shifting focus away from the delegation, the justices instead concentrate on the rights in subsections 7 and 8, but consider that these have not been exercised despite a clear indication from the parents that they want their children back. In fact, the only thing that stands in their way is the bail conditions imposed upon them, and yet Lady Hale somehow thinks that a bail condition prohibiting unsupervised contact is not insuperable to taking the children back. The whole judgment is either self-contradictory or pushes the definitions of important legal terms so far as to be meaningless. I think there is a better way to achieve the same result by instead focusing on the definition of parental responsibility. In this case, the parents have parental responsibility, but perhaps we should stop for a minute and think about how realistic this actually is. At this point, you are probably thinking I have gone mad by suggesting that parents don't have parental responsibility, but do you stick with me? The bail conditions set by the police following the arrest did not allow unsupervised contact with any of the children, so how real or practical is the parental responsibility in this situation? In a strict legal sense, the parents would still be able to make decisions with respect to their children if they were, for example, hospitalised, but for the purposes of exercising their rights under subsection 7 and 8, that status is ineffective so there is a strong argument that it should simply not be applied. Once the bail conditions are removed and full parental responsibility is restored, then the rights could be exercised, but until that point the definition would not be satisfied. Not only would this put the same result on a much more solid legal footing, but would also completely avoid the nonsensical idea that the delegation of parental responsibility need not be fully informed. Overall, though, we should also ask whether this is indeed the right result, and under what principles the law should operate. The state taking children away from their parents is something to be rightly concerned about. Even in this case where, if we're being honest, these are hardly parents of the year we're talking about, 
is a huge step to actually remove the children and provide alternative accommodation. The potential for long-lasting psychological damage, especially for the younger children, is huge even where the displacement only lasts for a couple of months. Of course, the power needs to exist where it is absolutely necessary, such as in cases of abuse or potentially here where the conditions were unsanitary, although perhaps there were other less extreme solutions to the problem like, I don't know, a cleaner. But in any case, the exercise of that power has to meet a very high threshold and should never be used for longer than needed. Well, thank you very much for tuning in again to the podcast. Thanks as ever to bensound.com for the uh, theme music. I just want to say a quick thank you as well to a person called Tim Slay Johnson, who kindly left a review of the podcast on iTunes. That is very much appreciated. Helps other people to discover the podcast as well. So if you haven't had a chance to rate and review the podcast yet, then uh, do make sure you do that either on iTunes or Stitcher, um, whatever podcast service you use. I'll be back with another case next week. In the meantime, bye. bye.